Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Andrew Chappelle back on the podcast. Uh, He was previously on episode 152, and that was evidence-based recommendations for bodybuilding back in April last year. So quite a lot has happened since then. Andrew's been through an entire prep um, and done incredibly well, uh, competing in the UK DFBA, WNBF, going to Worlds, and now hopefully fully or pretty much fully recovered how are you feeling andrew actually i never asked oh yeah thanks for uh, inviting me back on see when you said that there though april was that when we did it last time god it seems like a lifetime ago um but yeah as you say i did a full prep last year did uh, did really well i mean fantastically competing in all those shows and um and now i'm well and truly back into the the off-season phase and uh, and recovering covering well but I mean I only finished dieting actually Steve in around about halfway through November so we're in January now so it's with Christmas and stuff it's only been about two months ish mm-hmm. really since then so it's not a lot of time has passed when you when you lay it down like that but no I'm uh, I'm getting back to full speed slowly but surely in the in the gym that's what I would say how I, I guess actually before we dig into like what you've been doing the last months. I think it'd be really cool for the listeners because you did a lot of shows actually, uh, which is awesome. Uh, I always think competitors, when they only do maybe like one or two shows, kind of like "Ah, get more kind of experience under your belt. So it's awesome to see you do so many and um, have so many experiences and lessons and learnings. I don't know if you want to take the listeners through kind of where you started, um, what your composition was like when you started and then how that process kind of moved through and... um, what shows you did and obviously give the results of those shows as well. Be yeah, awesome. of and just to reiterate what you just said there, I mean, you sent me some questions to answer beforehand and I was racking my brain about what sort of things I could, I could answer that would be not maybe perhaps the, the usual ones. And that point you just made there about people not doing shows um, or enough shows, I think is, is a great one, particularly for the, the beginner. And I mean, I'll maybe save this point, and come back to it, come back to it later. But it's 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 really really important. So where did it all begin? Gosh, um, well, what I'll say is I am in the process of writing a journal that will reflect on all of these things and go by step by step the nutrition that I followed, the diet that I, uh, the training plan that I followed, how the composition changed over time, and I'll put it on my website proprepcoaching.com. But I'm I'm not there yet. I started writing it in November. I'll come back to it and uh, and finish it later on. So initially, the goal was around about last December time, I think I I was speaking to Steph, my partner, and we said, well, shall we do a guest spot this year? Because I didn't have really any plans at all of of competing. I'd competed in 2017, and I thought, well, I need to maybe get myself back on stage at some point, but I wasn't quite ready to compete yet. So I thought, well, a guest spot might be quite a good way to just sort of Keep me accountable if you like, get my body fat levels lower, and make sure, give me something to train for if you like. So that plan initially was around about June to do that guest spot. Um, so I started to diet in around about um, February for that, is, is what I would say. Now, up until around about December prior to that, the training wasn't going particularly well, but that sort of lit the fire a little bit then. And I started to get back to some uh, some decent numbers in the gym. Composition started to get a little bit more in check, even though it was around Christmas and I like drinking red wine. Um, and it probably was somewhere in region of about, I don't know, 12 to, to 15%-ish. And if you look on my, my Instagram profile, if you go scroll all the way back through if you want to creep on me, you can see some uh, some older pictures of myself that time last year and what it was sort of looking like for there. I managed to get my diet actually quite down quite well. And I mean, I wrote some things down here. I managed to get up to around about 3,800 calories on a high day, around about 3,400 on a sort of rest day. And that was working out around about 40 calories per kilogram of body weight, about 5.5 grams of carbs, 2.2 grams of protein and 1.1 grams of fat. And that's around about 90 kilograms. So that's that's where I was sitting. I was strong. Uh, my numbers were coming back up. I mean, I managed to squat again up to around about 212, which was decent. I retired from deadlifting because that just breaks me. 
broke, but I was benching quite well. I mean, I got back up to a 165 bench, which I was pretty wow. happy with. And I was in, I was in a good place, um, despite only really having a short period of between around about, well, it was three months between around about December to February where I started this sort of prep. So that was the initial starting point. Um, thereafter that, I thought, okay, we need to prep for this guest spot that we're doing. Um, and I, I made a, an adjustment to the calories. So I went from that 3,800, uh, the 3,400 lower days, and I brought it down just to around about 3,300 and about 2,900 in the rest day. So just made a just made a cut in the calories. There was nothing um, overly sophisticated in terms of having refeed days or carbohydrate cycling mm-hmm. or five toing or, or anything like that. It was just simply periodized nutrition. On the days when I trained, I reduced the calorie amount. And on the days when I was resting, I reduced the calorie amount. And I kind of went with that, Steve, more or less for the whole prep. Oh, wow. I mean, it was nothing nothing really massively changed overall. I mean, as my weight came down, I adjusted the calories so that they came down, but the relative amounts of the nutrients were more or less pretty stable. So I stayed around about 30 to 32 calories per kilogram of body weight for the whole whole diet. Protein was around about 2.3 grams a whole diet. Carbs were around about 5 grams a whole diet, and fat was around about 0.8 grams the, the whole diet as well. So that was fairly consistent, and that was effective at bringing me from, say, that 90 kilograms all the way down to um, 79.9-ish or 79.4. And then so I lost about 10 kilos, give or take some water and things okay. like that as well, all in. So that's that's kind of like an overview of uh, the dietary practices that I kind of followed. The overall diet in the end, I mean, it was from February through till um, November, so it worked out around about 10, 11 months. So <laughs> how, many, how many weeks is that? 40 odd weeks, something like that. Um, and, the, and there was phases when I wasn't really losing a, a whole lot of weight um, at all. I think between the, um, I mean, I know you're fond of this concept of the, the, the diet break, if you like. Right. And I mean, there was a period between around about June um, and August where I didn't really lose any weight at all. I just sort of stabilized okay. and I didn't change my diet at all. So that was almost like a, it wasn't a planned break. I just didn't make any adjustments because I thought I was coming in quite quickly okay. uh, and I didn't want to come in too quickly and then overall end up losing the muscle mass at the, the other end of the diet. So that's where we were in terms of nutritional content. In terms of foods, um, it was your standard sort of bodybuilding stuff. Uh, you know, so everyone eats oats in the morning. I ate eggs in the morning. Some things I had away, just depending on how busy I was that particular day or how lazy I was more or less actually that day. Um, I had whole grain cereals, so rice and potatoes were the sort of things I was having with my main protein meals, which would vary between either chicken. Some things I had um, beef on occasion, plenty of green vegetables. I kept dairy in my diet. That was something that I changed actually this time so i was having um faz yogurt or skewer yogurt oh yeah again depending on how my preference changes pro uh, and i kept bread i suppose in my diet for much longer than i normally would i think i kept that in all the way towards the sort of latter stages where i was just having a bagel in my right. diet with some sliced chicken and that just practically made sense because i couldn't sit down like i did in the past and just eat six meals of chicken and rice a day and plus <laughs> I, I'm long gone with, with doing those sort of diets at all as well. <laughs> They're no fun. Yeah. Um, but that, that's just a, a personal thing. So that, that was more or less the plan um, and, the, and the foods that we were sort of selecting. And like I say, I'll, I'll put all this down in a proper journal blog when I get round to it on the, the Pro Prep Coaching website. So, the train, so we decided to do that June, July sort of guest spot. Um, and then around about July... Steph suggested I should do the UK BFF Scottish Championships. Yeah. Just because I hadn't been on stage for ages. And um, it'd been two years at that point. And I thought, well, you know what, I'm in fairly good shape. I can I can do the um I can do the eighty under ninety kilo class, even though I was about eighty four kilos at the time. Um I mean my conditioning and my shape and everything was enough in that particular show and I'm prevent as a pro natural bodybuilder, that was always gonna be okay. And the, and the carrot really was that um, 
if you did well at this particular show, they were giving out Arnold Classic invites. Oh, cool. So I was cool. like, oh, yeah, that, that sounds like a pretty good one to me. Uh, unfortunately, well, I won the won the contest, and Steph tells me that I was the best bodybuilder in the show. So, I mean, that's that's very nice for you to say that. <laughs> so I won the class. For some reason, though, they don't put all the classes together and do that overall thing. But okay. Who knows why? So I did, did it as a little tune-up, and it was just nice to sort of dust off the cobwebs, get back up on stage, be under those hot lights again. Yeah. And be in front of an audience because I love performing and being up there and presenting and showing the the muscle fans your your physique, showing it off to people that appreciate. It. So yeah, it was a it was a really good experience. And then around about that time, um, we sort of decided that well, do you know what? Instead of just doing this guest spot, I'll go and I'll just I may as well just compete. So right. the decision was was made around about then to go on and just do the uh, the DFAC Grand Prix, which um, was in. September, I think it was. Was that right? September. So I died all the way through to to September. After that point, from uh, from July. Now, I've said a lot of things here, um, <laughs> and hopefully you've taken it all in. I've not gone too fast. Is is that all okay so far? Yeah. Something that just sprung to mind is, I guess, the really cool thing for you, or I, mm. I assume this is cool, is, and I think from having looked over some of the kind of research that you've done, you have kind yeah. of ideas about uh, rate of loss in terms of how much sure. body weight yeah. per week we're looking to lose. And you said kind of calories per body weight didn't really have to change. Yeah. And I guess it's a case of as you wanted your rate of loss to slow down, that meant that the food, like the food, it just worked quite nicely in that the body yeah. adapted in that way. Yeah, that that's exactly it. I mean, we've got this sort of idea that if you dip, below 30 calories per kilogram of body weight in a female and 25 calories calories per kilogram of body weight in a male, then you're going to start seeing negative adaptations taking place in terms of suppression of thyroid hormone, if, if you like, um, suppression of testosterone, um, increases in... Um, ghrelin hormones, et cetera, making you want to, to go and eat. So the metabolism slows down to, to use the, the quote unquote bro term. So I guess what you'd want to do is spend periods of time below that number and then period of times above that number. And so the overall average amount of calories might be around about 30 calories per kilogram of body weight. And then there's ways you can do that by manipulating the, um, the calorie intake over the course of the week by doing carbohydrate cycling, cycling or, or carb cycling. I was aware that I was losing weight too quickly, so I didn't manipulate that number. As I was saying, um, I kept it relatively constant. And that's where that sort of, as I say, that idea of about the, the diet break came in, where I just sort of stabilized my weight for a period of time, maintained performance in the gym, I got used to performing at that sort, of, uh, that sort of body weight, so it wasn't just a case of a steep drop over time. At the point I was, does that all make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So the, the research that I did absolutely helped inform me about how I was going to approach the diet. But 100%, I knew from the outset that I wanted to keep my calories above a certain amount in terms of that kilograms per body weight recommendation. I wanted to keep my carbohydrates above a certain amount. I wanted to keep them around about five grams per kilogram of body weight. I wanted to keep protein around about 2.3 grams. And uh, I wanted to keep fat. I didn't want to go quite as low as I'd gone in the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the past, I think I've gone as low as about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 grams per kilogram of body weight of fat. But I wanted to keep this a little bit higher. So I took some energy out of the carbohydrates where I'd gone higher and just put a little bit more in fat because we know that we, we like to talk in terms of testosterone synthesis coming from the, uh, the fatty acids. So maybe keeping that a little bit higher. So I had that sort of diet um, stabilization period, if, if you like in there. Uh, hopefully that all makes sense. Now, the, the point I was going to come on to make was, well, with the, with the show being in September, um, I could have upped my game and been more aggressive with the diet, but then I made plans to do other shows that followed it, aka the, sorry, the UK DFBA show, the Mr. Universe, and then right. the subsequent WMBF Worlds. So it was, it's always a bit of a balancing act. So what, what show do you peak for? 
And certainly if I had peaked for that um, DFAC one, I might have been in better condition. But how, and I might have, and I probably would have been able to carry it into that UK DFPA one, but then competing in November thereafter, the package that I brought to that mm. stage might not have been quite as good. So does that make sense? The- yeah, I think, well, like you said, I mean, for first time competitors, this probably isn't something they necessarily need to think about unless, I mean, yeah. some people know if they're at that level where, I mean, they have to plan where they're going to look their best. But for you, you've competed multiple times you know you're at a certain level you're a pro so you know that you need to be a bit strategic about where you pick to look your best so no it makes complete sense yeah the one 100 so i mean you when you put the question to me before we did this interview where could i have what things could i have done differently i was thinking well how do i gauge success yeah. in this um in this discussion because i mean i could have been more aggressive with the dieting in the earlier phase to peak in those earlier shows, but would that have negatively affected my performance at the, the far end of the year? And the guy, uh, to use an example, Ben Lloyd, who I competed against in the, um, the the September show, by the time we got to the um, November show, and hopefully Ben won't be doing this because I spoke to him at the time, he wasn't as good as he was back then, but I had passed where, where he was. So it's, it's a bit of a balancing act. I guess I, I could have started my diet a little bit later, but because Steph was dieting as well, I thought, well, I'll just show solid, solidarity with her and just diet at the same time along with her because I don't want to be eating cream cakes while she's um, <laughs> eating chicken and rice. Because no, she said do. she wouldn't mind. But <laughs> maybe, she, no, maybe you don't with right, her I reaction. <laughs> <laughs> she's in the background there just being like, she's on. <laughs> I should mention it. It's it's Steph Noble Figure Pro. So check her out on Instagram. She's she's quite good at bodybuilding. I can yeah, I can further that recommendation. She is very good. Um, yeah, incredible. <laughs> Both of she's, you. <laughs> uh, she's she's very good at it. So where, where are we? Where are we going now? I've um, I've got a little bit lost. So we did. I planned to do that DFAC show then. So I did that show. Um, third place at that one. When when I look back on that one. I was pretty happy with the package that I brought on on the day. I felt I got a bit of a, a raw deal in that particular show, um, but I guess that's that's just me. And different different judges on on different days would, would maybe judge it differently. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I don't know what to, to really say about about that one. But I, I sort of I reset and then I thought, okay, let's go on and do the the UK DFBA show thereafter um thereafter that one which fall fell a couple of months later because previously i'd had the um the pro card that i'd got from the bmbf and then um, we decided that we'd go and get go and compete with the uk dfba because i think over the years the uh, the uk dfba has really upped its game by comparison to what the bmbf are offering and i would say it's now past the bmbf at this point in terms of who is the number one Natural Bodybuilding Federation within the UK. So I thought, well, let's go now compete on that stage towards the um, the end of the year and then potentially compete on the uh, the WMBF stage, which was in New York at the end of the year. I mean, it's the opportunity to go and compete in New York. I mean, that's pretty cool. Yep. Which natural bodybuilder doesn't want to do that? Which sports person doesn't want to try and do something like that as uh, as well? So I sort of readjusted and reset for, um, for that one, which was a few... A few months later, after that BMBF show, I had some food afterwards because I've been dieting since February. That was like the first time as well from that whole diet where I had right. any cheating at all in the whole diet. Steph's like, Steph gets on at me. She's like, what you do would actually terrify me. She says to me, it's like how you can actually just do a diet from one point, eat the same thing near enough every single day until Robot. the end of the diet and just do that. That's, <laughs> that's pretty hardcore. Um, and... Only a certain type of individual is going to be able to do that. I wouldn't recommend that for everyone. Yeah, and I think, well, considering how many shows you did, if you were to yeah. do what you did after that show every time you see it with competitors, that ends their season if they end up going too far. So somewhat of it is required for you, I think. Yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So had some food afterwards. We went to a restaurant, had an Italian's. Next day, I think we um, went and had some... Uh, nice fish and chips and things like that, and then got back on the diet on a, on the Tuesday. Dieted until the um, 
show, which was in October, I think it was. Did that one, and that was the UK DFBA, and that was uh, that was a great experience. I'd have to say the the contrast between competing in that show at the um, BNBF finals way up in Scotland in October compared to competing um, down in the Coventry show was it was night and day. Just the, the general environment was was much more welcoming. Um, the the promoters were happy to see you there. They wanted you to be part of the show. They were genuinely interested in um, in you as a bodybuilder. Um, everyone was really helpful, and they were really pleased to have, like obviously myself, to compete with them. And the competition was really good. Uh, I met loads of great guys uh, competing down there. So um, competed against Jerry. He was uh, great in the middleweight class. Oh yeah, I've competed yeah. against him a couple of times oh, now. Yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> always beat can... me, of course. <laughs> he's very good. Well, he's got a shit moustache, right? We'll just say that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Jerry knows I've been slagging him off about that moustache, so it's fine. <laughs> so I did that show. Uh, I won the, the middleweight category, competed against Ben Lloyd uh, again, and that was in the, the overall because he competed in the pros. He won the um, the heavyweight class. He beat uh, a really good King Solomon. Um, oh, what's Solomon's second name? I just referred to his... Uh, I know. I've forgotten it as well. It. Yeah, yeah. He's, it's Solomon. He's, he's really good. Great physique. Really, really good. Um, so we were in the overall together, and uh, Ben bested my bested me again. Uh, unfortunately, on that occasion, if I look back on it, I was in better shape than the um, the BMBS show where I'd got myself down to really low body fat levels. And just for some perspective, I've I've had my body fat levels analysed by um, bioelectrical impedance, skin calipers, and um, by air displacement as well. And with the air displacement, that's your bod pod, if you like. Oh, yeah. You get, I've had about 6% body fat for contests. Bioelectrical impedance, I've had it down about 3%. And the, the skin calipers, I've had about 3 or 4%. But in terms of millimeter thickness, I for this last contest, my skinnies, as we like to call them, were um, sub 29 mil. So that's really, really low for anyone that knows anything about skin calipers. That maybe gives you an idea what body fat percentage and sort of conditioning I was in. And you can go on my Instagram and you can look at the photographs from those particular shows as well. Um, again, contest mistakes and things like that I would do differently. My tan was shit for that show, which was, oh, no. unfortunately, it wasn't quite dark enough. I used Pro Tan. I'd used it previously when um, I competed way back in 2007, actually. God, was the first time I used Pro Tan. And I thought they got the recipe, if you like, a little bit better. But it just it wasn't quite dark enough. Um, Steph's was really light. I think I think I kind of got away with it, but maybe if I had a slightly darker tan, it would have helped. But anyway, the, I got a pro card off of that. That was really good fun. And then um, I got to compete in the, the Pro International as well in that mm-hmm. particular day. So that was my second pro this season, show this season. Then after that, I had the um, Mr. Universe contest. That was a great contest to go and do. So I know a guy up in Scotland called um, Ian Lawrence, Mr. Universe 1975. He's a, he's a total legend up in uh, these parts. And uh, he runs the NABA Scotland. He's the promoter. So he didn't have anyone doing the classic class or the female classes. So we just said, well, Ian, can we do it? And he was like, yeah, we, I'd love you to do it. So we got a special invite to go and do uh, do that show down in um, Bradford. And that was, that was just awesome, Steve, to be part of the Mr. Universe contest. I mean, this right. is one of the most historic bodybuilding contest for an amateur in the world ever. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Reg Park and Frank Zane and all these guys had done uh, had done this contest. I mean, and it's a contest that had been around for like over 75 years. I mean, think about that. Bodybuilding shows, 75 years old. So that was great. I, I absolutely adored getting to compete, about, compete in that one. But I had to make weight, right? Okay. So again, you're asking me about contest mistakes. So I did the... BMBF show, and then I had some food afterwards. I did the um, UK DFBA show, and because we're in uh, Coventry, I think we got curry. Right. So, but but the, the amount of time spent afterwards indulging myself was slightly longer than the first diet that I did. So instead of two days, it was three days. So I actually ended up gaining a little bit of weight. I was like, crap, I need to be under 80 kilos for this Mr. Universe contest. So I think it was like about 83 or 84 kilos like two weeks to go until this contest at the universe. 
It's, most of that was like water, which yeah. I was holding over it as well. But I was probably holding a little bit more fat, so I had to diet my ass off to get back in shape for this Mr. Universe. And then I drove from um, from Edinburgh to Bradford, uh, and Steph's like cursing me this whole experience, like with like the heating on in the car, not drinking any water, basically having a protein shake for breakfast and some eggs or something, so that I could get down, make weight, and then as soon as I got on the scales, I think I was about seventy nine point eight or six or something like that, and then carb up with as much. Yeah carbohydrates so I can get the muscles full again as well. Now, in terms of a strategy, that is one that I would not suggest. <laughs> I would suggest that you do the bodybuilding contest, you get back on your diet the next day immediately, and you just continue to diet mm -hmm. as normal, and then you come in comfortably for the weight. That's probably not realistic after 11 months of dieting that you're going to be thinking, ah, oh, sack it, I'll just not have any food the next day after I've just won the pro card and and everything like that after it. You're, you're just not going to do it. So, not the best. Oh, I should add, actually, it was amazing, right? We did the UK DFBA show, right? And we got these fantastic, great big medals. So we've got all these uh, medals. We rocked into um, the hotel after that show. Um, we were staying at the Rico Arena. And because we were wearing the medals, the woman behind the curtain was like, oh my God, what have you just done? We've got an upgrade, Steve. Top suite. I think I saw the picture on Instagram. Oh, did you see it? <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. It was so, there was baths. There was like two baths in the suite and the like the living room. So you could like watch telly from the bath with the giant bed and everything around the place. So yeah, we, we indulged ourselves that night. <laughs> champagne and everything like that. I remember Steph was like, oh my God, I'm getting champagne. <laughs> so yeah, things I would not do. Um, that sort of approach whereby you've got to almost carb deplete for a few days beforehand to then make the weight for the competition and then get the carbohydrates back into you thereafter because I don't think I was able to get the fullness yeah. back into myself to the level that I needed to be to be competitive against those guys on that Navi Universe stage. And I did really well. I mean, we had like 25 guys in that classic class lineup. I made the final call out of the last six guys, but unfortunately on that occasion, I didn't manage to uh, place. I didn't learn my lesson from the UK DFBA show. I went with Pro Tan again because I thought, well, it was just dark enough that time. I don't think the lighting's going to be quite as bright at this particular show, but um, well, we'll just see how it goes. And then um, it, just, it just wasn't dark enough. So that, that, that doesn't help you. And these little things really matter in terms mm -hmm. of prepping for, uh, for competitions. Anyway, so that was the universe. So that, that was great. Like I said, I absolutely loved it. Really, really cool. And Steph did fantastic. She was fourth in the athletic figure category. I think she could have been a place higher and place third. But for a natural bodybuilder, female, to compete in that class and do as well as she did, amazing. Really, she looked amazing. Really, really good. Inspiring, I think, for, for any female who's thinking, mm. what can you achieve naturally? And, and they placed as well as she did without again, girls who are taking drugs. It's an amazing accomplishment. And then finally, um, we went on and we did the uh, the WMBF World. So that was the final show. That was in New York City. And I was my absolute best for that show, undoubtedly. I mean, I, I remember looking at myself the, day, the morning of the competition. My tan was spot on. I was much leaner than I was at any of the other shows thereafter on that competition uh, earlier on the year. I was fuller, I'd nailed that perfectly, I'd made the weight. So I was really, really pleased with that look. What I will say though is that of all the shows that I've done this year, the best photos that I got were probably from maybe the Universe or from okay. the UK DFBA. So it's not quite reflected, I don't think, in the um, in the photographs I got, but I know that for me that that was my, my best sort of look. And I came third um, in the, the middleweight class at the, uh, the world. So that was well. I love that. I mean, it's it really is a sort of celebration of yeah. of muscle men from around the world. You've got you had guys in my class, for example, the guy that won it was from Taiwan, and the guy that was second was from Barbados. I'm from Scotland. The guy that was fourth was um, oh, where was he from again? I think he was an Italian. 
the guy in fifth place was an American. And then, like, I'm speaking to guys from Ethiopia. The judges are all from all over the world as well. So really, truly world finals. Um, really, really great. And then you're in an international city as well. So after that, I mean, we, we had a week off, more or less, in New York, going around Times Square and everything like that, which took us to around about the start of December. Um, mm. Well, about probably about the 22nd or 23rd or something like that. And then I don't think I went back to the gym after that until about mid-December. And then Christmas happened. I mean, I'm not going to train around Christmas after just and all that. So there you go, Steve. <laughs> That's the whole story. Um, I don't know if this is a bit much more <laughs> than what you were anticipating, but I've given you a lot, and there's some anecdotes in amongst all of that that maybe your listeners can pull out of it that they might find quite interesting. Hey guys, hope you're enjoying the podcast. Just wanted to take one moment of your time to actually talk about our coaching services over at Revive Stronger. We at Revive Stronger, we offer an incredible premium personal coaching service just for people like you and I know you will love it. Do you want to work with us? Here's what I need you to do. Head over to revivestronger.com. Go up to the coaching tab, click on online coaching. Once there, read through the requirements and what it takes to be an online client. Once finished, hit apply now and you're only one step away from applying to our services. Fill out the Google form and you're done. And that was basically it. A coach is going to reach out to you shortly and then it's Team Revive Stronger. No, I think it's it's really nice to have actually just had a, a full overview and for you to just take it step by step and to pull out, like you said, those little anecdotes. And I guess one thing I will uh, bring up because you brought it up a few times was the tan and how important that oh, is because yeah. I think you're completely right. It's massively underrated how important just yeah, the, the tan is itself. Is it? What would you do? Like, what did you do for the WMBF Worlds, and what do you think you do in future? All oh, right, okay. So this is what I would do. Um, I would use A1 tan. That's the particular Nicola Gilbert. Product. Yeah, Nicola Gilbert. Like, it's a really good tan. I mean, it's it's great stuff. When I competed, when I competed with the DFAC, I would use their dark as tan because that seems to work really well on their stages. So I just would use that if I was going to compete there and use their glaze that they have for you. Um, but then when I went away to compete on a different stage, I hadn't used any other tan for about, God, it must have been about eight years or something like that prior to when that product came out. So I was back in like a case of, well, what tanning products are out there again? And I was familiar with Pro Tan. I kind of knew how dark it got. Uh, I'd used Jan Tana in the past and I didn't really like, I think it kind of makes you look a bit yellowy sometimes. Right. And I don't think it's quite dark enough, so I went with the um, the Pro Tan. But uh, no, I would definitely 100%. I would use the the A1 Tan. I think it gives you a really nice color. It's really easy to put on. Really, really easy to put on. And um, yeah, you get a great sort of finish off of it. Skin prep's important, though. If you've got to make sure that you spend some time moisturizing, exfoliating, making sure that your skin's all prepped prior to, uh, to putting this sort of stuff on. And I guess the, the best endorsement I can get for that is um, Steph, when we went out to the Worlds, did a lot of competitors' tans and a lot of the girls' tans, she helped them out. And she said that my tan went on the best compared to all of, her, uh, of the fader sexies, which you, I guess you wouldn't expect. You'd expect them to maybe be looking after the skin a little bit better, but maybe that's, that's just the difference between the pro levels in terms of presentation. Although I didn't get the tan right, I should say, prior to that with, with the other two shows. So the, nobody's infallible. I can remember for my first show, I used Pro Tan and yep. uh, I got feedback from the judges that it wasn't great. And ever since that, <laughs> I've just gone with Nicola Gilbert, just get the professional yeah. tan. Uh, and it's really funny, the little intricacies that you don't think people don't consider when they do yeah. bodybuilding, like the shaving, the skin prep, the moisturization, the, the exfoliation. Oh, it's it's so important. It's so so important. You're you're a hundred percent, hundred percent right on that. And what I will say, we, we were having a little conversation before we started this, and I think it can maybe come in here now. Cool. That's the sort of idea that I know you're prepping for a show just now, and I said it off air, but so I don't mind just saying it again. That you're looking great. You've you've really Thank improved you. the last time that you've uh, you've got on stage, and I think that's a win already. Um, and you should always bear that and bear that in mind, but. You're doing this idea of a sort of slow burn to to get yourself in shape for a show, and that's effectively what my research always sort of 
well, that's what it kind of demonstrates that if you want to be a high level competitor, then a slower diet really, really helps you. But it's this sort of idea about, if you imagine the, the bodybuilders um, who are competing in the 70s and 80s, and even some guys that are doing it just now, because I remember I've, I've read like um, Robbie Robinson's book and things like this. Um, I always get confused with is it? Yeah, it's Robbie Robinson. Um, anyway, and he said he competed like, I don't know, a dozen more times a year. He'd just go on a diet, come down and then lose some weight. And then uh, guys like Mike Mentor and stuff like that doing themselves. And then other guys like, um, I mean, if I take someone like a Will Usher, for example, who's a great competitor, master's competitor. The, these guys, um, they're only doing like 12-week diets and stuff like that, right, for, for their shows. But what I'll say is they don't quite get that crazy, crazy condition. They get enough so that that shows their dis their balance of their physique, their symmetry, and that's enough in a lot of cases for a guy like Will to to win a show. But for someone like me, I couldn't win being not a hundred percent. And I've often thought like if I could if if it was just a case of doing twelve week diets, I could compete every single year. Like it's just twelve week diet, just twelve week diet do a show, and that would be a so much more sustainable approach. Yeah. But Compared to getting that sort of extreme level of uh, conditioning, it's, it's a slightly different story. Does, does that make sense? Oh, 100%. And I think there's just an element of uh, it's becoming more and more well known that time is needed as a natural. And part of yeah. that is we don't have any outside help coming through yeah. to make us maintain muscle mass. And at the end of the day, it's not just about bringing condition. It's also that condition comes through having muscle so if you end up sacrificing muscle which i think probably does happen when people try and rush it off to get that condition 100%. yeah you're, you're absolutely right one thing that i'm very conscious of and i think it was dave k said this to me and he, he's he's so right is when you go into the pro ranks male or female size matters like you can't just be lean you you need that size so you need to diet for a long time to hold that size so you can be competitive against these guys because some of them are huge like some of these guys are absolutely massive and that was one thing that really helps me when i go to when particularly competing in a middleweight class there's not many guys who have my clavicle uh, width and have the amount of thickness that i've got across my shoulders chest girdle but in the back and stuff and i can i might come up against guys that are maybe slightly neater in the waist or slightly small joints and nice muscle bellies but the years of heavy lifting the power lifting the strongman training just gives me the amount of muscle i need to just just be bigger than them and bodybuilding i mean it is about symmetry and force and stuff like that but you still need size so it really important it's really important in the pro ranks in particular and something to mention i guess at this point because i think at least um, as far as i'm concerned you're pretty well known for presentation and posing yeah, and you. that i mean you have to work with what you've got and present it yeah. in the best way possible and i think you're definitely someone who can do that and i'd love to just hear you talk about i don't know your your philosophy there how much practice you put in how did you go about figuring out what worked for you yeah oh great question great question and again i 100 percent agree you need to work with what you've got and um, there's no one way to pose that will work for absolutely everyone because we're all slightly different shapes. So it means that you have to, to tweak the poses. And I know there are eight mandatories and then the four base poses, but they can still be tweaked to suit the, uh, to suit the physique. And um, one thing that really helped me this year is that my partner, Steph Noble, she's a posing coach. And I mean, I was, I think I was always a good poser before um, Han, but when I'm, Working with Steph, I thought, right, I better up my game here because I can't be a shoddy poser if, uh, if Steph's a posing coach and I'm going out there not being very well presented um, in that respect. I mean, posing's important. Stage time's really important. That WMBF Worlds I did, I think I was on stage, no joke, for about 40 minutes. Wow. Right? And it wasn't like your traditional bodybuilding show whereby they take your they do call outs and then they shuffle you about and then they move the guys to the back of the stage and they bring them forward again and other guys to the back of the stage and forward. So you get a chance to rest. What they did was they just had like all 20 odd guys in the class, brought them all out, put the, the guys in the middle that they were obviously considered as being the top five. And then they just went round and round and round. So there was no hiding place at all. It was brutal, <laughs> absolutely brutal. I don't think I've ever posed as hard as that 
um, in, in my life. And all the practice I did really paid off for a moment like that because, and I say this with the guys that I work with in the studio and the girls, you've got to realize that as you fatigue, you start to make mistakes in your posing. And as you start to make mistakes, um, then your posing breaks down and then you're not presenting yourself quite as well as you otherwise could be presenting yourself. And those are the moments, unfortunately, when you might be getting judged mm. and you either lose a point or maybe you gain a point in comparison to your um, to your fellow peers who are on stage because we've all seen it. The guy comes out, he looks 100%, he looks like he's the winner. By the end of the class, 15 minutes have passed and he's no longer the guy you're looking at. He's he's faded. He's um, he's just not holding himself quite as well as he, he has otherwise could. But uh, no, no, posing so important. So I actually pose, Steve, Monday to Friday, every Monday to Friday for the whole diet. In the morning, I did 20 minutes, the whole, whole diet. And I sort of used it as almost a calorie burning exercise. I thought, yeah. well, I could go out and pound pavements and just get a little bit of morning cardio and to try and um, up my activity levels. Or I could just pose and get the same sort of effect. So I was using it as a calorie burning effect. I was also using it to build up my endurance for the time when I was going to be on, on stage. And it's, I guess it's an idea about being sports specific with what you're doing with your training because there's not many ways in bodybuilding we can be sports specific. But one way we can be is we can pose. So... I would do the uh, the mandatory poses, the free symmetry rounds. Uh, I would start by holding that first front relaxed pose for two minutes in the mirror, just solid without moving. And then I would do rounds of uh, 30 seconds of each pose. Then I'd go straight into the muscularity poses, two, three rounds of that. Um, all transitions as well, never relaxing, because you have to remember, I mean, you're always being looked at yeah. um, the whole time. So you, those transition poses are as important as the um, the poses when you're uh, when you're well when you're in pose. And then when I finished all that, I would then hold that front relax pose again for two minutes again. And I guess the and that would take me around about twenty to twenty five minutes to do that. So that's how much I was doing every morning. I did it when I first woke up. I just had an espresso coffee. I uh, took some took my multivitamins and my fish oil and stuff like that. And then I just held the poses. And the idea was well. If I'm going to be on stage when you're tired, you're fatigued, you're under stress, that's difficult to recreate. But if I can do it first thing in the morning when I've not got much energy, then at least that's something that might replicate some of those sort of conditions. So I posed every morning like that, and it really paid off by the time I got to the end. And then what I would do is I would just play about with poses, Steve. So I would, I mean... I've got Arnold Schwarzenegger's encyclopedia sitting on the desk just over there, and he's just to flick through it. Yeah. And I'm always inspired by those classical guys. I mean, Arnold's my hero. And, like, I watched Pumping Iron last week. but um, So, like, all the shots that those guys make, which are really aesthetic, I mean, I would just try them out, and I would imposing's almost like a dance, putting yeah. it all together in a routine. So I would just move through them and see which poses would work well in sequence and what ones would suit my particular body so was it for example if i did a an abs and thighs would it be better if i flared my arms out or put my elbows in um i mean it might make me make make me look narrow in certain poses for some people but for me it's maybe more aesthetic um i would twist my knees out or twist them in i would look at the poses that guys are doing i just i would just try them out because i want to create the most aesthetic shapes as i as i can even the um the mandatory shots, for example, like a rear double bicep, I might do it with the hands open rather than the, the fists fully clenched just to get a different variation in it. And when when you're looking at the pros, I mean, all the guys have got, they're all great. I mean, no one's really got any weaknesses. And I guess people have described my physique as looking classical. And if I can provide something slightly different for the judges, mm -hmm. For them to look at maybe that will draw their eyes something slightly different and give me give me an edge so that presentation element for me is so important because if i can stand out from the crowd if you like then maybe i i draw on um <laughs> maybe i get more scores more more points so tons of practice Debo, yeah. tons. that's a lot of practice that, that you're doing and sometimes you can't be arsed doing it mm. but just 
have to get up and you just have to do it and squeeze those muscles and just build up that, that endurance. So I guess, yeah, my, my philosophy is lots of practice. Try to give the judges something slightly, slightly different. And also I am inspired by these classical and aesthetic guys of old school. So I want to try and replicate that because that for me is what bodybuilding is. And then I guess the final thing is, or the final two things is, bodybuilding is as much about art and entertainment as it is about sport. So I have to try and make something which is visually appealing and entertaining that you want to want to watch. And then I, the, the, the human body is a beautiful thing. So we want to try and replicate these sort of statuesque things that the Greeks and Romans were trying to replicate. So if I can look like that, then along with being entertaining and looking athletic, then I guess that's mission accomplished. Does that all make sense? No, 100%. And I think uh, a lot of the people listening, probably uh, if they were competitors, probably 20 minutes of posing a day sounds like a lot, and especially holding that front relaxed for two minutes. Yeah. But when you that, consider... That's the most important pose, that exactly. one there. Which uh, yeah. is, a, is a fact that I kind of hate because it's probably my least appealing pose. Uh, but you, like you said, like for me, I shift my hips really far back um, yeah. to try and make the waist look as narrow as possible. And yeah. uh, like you said, pl playing around with different poses, not thinking you just have to hit it in a standard way as long as you hit the, the kind of guidelines that they provide you and you're not kind of doing something crazy that they're like standing on one leg or something like that <laughs> then uh, you're you're good there and something i don't know if you did it but i think i had i had a note about you doing vacuums um i think you hit quite yes. a lot of, like your poses doing a vacuum did you practice that as well that's something i've yeah, not I, had any I experience practice, with i did practice that yeah it's this, this is true what i'll say on that that last thing just before i go into that is if you're thinking about competing and you've I mean, you've never done it before, or even if you have done it before, just get in touch with someone that's a really good poser and ask them to, for advice or get a posing coach because it makes such a difference to your ability to pre present yourself. I mean, we spend all year trying to put an inch on your bicep. And if you can't present your biceps effectively, you can easily lose that inch just because you're not aware how to tweak your arm properly or, or something like that. Or you can just create something that you're more proud of um, when you're on stage. Because when you get when you've done the whole bodybuilding process and it's all said and done, all you've often got is the pictures and the memories. Yeah. And you want to have some great looking photographs as well, but from stage. But maybe for um, a photo shoot, you might do as well. I mean, you want to be able to present yourself effectively in there. But uh, go, going on to the vacuums, yes, this this was something that I I did practice. Um, I'm going to be honest, I thought I was a bit crap at it. <laughs> <laughs> I tried my best. I tried my best to, to, really, to really nail it. Uh, and I did a lot of it. So if you go on the internet, you can find lots of different guides to get your head around trying to do the vacuum. And guys will say that you have to like kind of blow through your nose and then seal your tongue on the top of your, your mouth to, to sort of create a vacuum while sucking in at the same time and then you bring all the air up into the top half. And the ways you kind of practice is it practice it is you do like sets of 10 of this breathing okay. and you, you, you kneel down doing it or you do it off the end of a chair and it'll help you achieve that vacuum. I don't think I quite nailed it compared to, I've seen other guys like Ben Lloyd who I competed against, really good at it. He could do it. Jerry who I competed against with the moustache, he could do it. Like my mate Steve um, McDonald, he's really good at it. So I don't think I quite nailed it. I think I got a lot better at it. So when I was doing like my front lat spread or I do my front double bicep or even try and do the, the abs and thighs, I could hold my stomach a lot tighter and I could create almost a, a vacuum of sorts, but it was almost like a, a pseudo vacuum. It wasn't quite, uh, quite there in it. I do think it helped me have a tighter waist though. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think it helped in terms of the, the training for that. So when you turn to the side and you do your side shots, it was tighter there when um, I was doing the front shots. I think it helped me keep things tighter as well. I think it helped my posture as well, actually, doing doing that amount of um, posing as well, which is maybe not surprising you're just because you're, you are working those core muscles, essentially, when uh, when you're doing it. Um, I would say to anyone that's, uh, that wants to practice, that wants to do the back, you know, you, again, it's like everything. You just kind of have to practice it and then um, just give it a shot, um, essentially. Does, does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's yeah, like anything, it's practice makes perfect, and all those comments make sense um, completely. So yeah, something I I did have a question of, and obviously we spoke about how you did quite a few different shows. Yeah. Did you peak for every one, and what was kind of your kind of? Did you try different things? Did you discover anything new? What was your philosophy going into each of those? Yeah, I, the, good questions, good questions. So the one that I did for the um, UK BFF, which was in July, I think I kind of guessed, decided to do that like the night before or something like that, or maybe like the week before. Um, so there was no peaking or anything like that after that uh, for that particular show. I think um, I think I just adjusted my meals around that particular day and took the fiber out the night before um, so that I was maybe not holding as much water. Um, and I think that's all I did for that particular show. So there was nothing really to write home about that one. The uh, the BMBF show, though, I did my sort of classical peaking that um, I've done several times in the past. And if you read the paper that we published on peak week strategies, um, I more or less did something exactly the same as that, whereby I restricted my carbohydrates for three days with a deplete. I then increased my carbohydrate intake um, initially in the first day by front loading with a lot of carbs. I think it was about tons of um, water went hand in hand with that, so it was about nine liters. And then I brought it down at the same time. I had salt alongside that. And then um, on the day of the contest, again, I restricted fiber, gave more car simple carbohydrates, and then simple carbohydrates before we went on stage. So that's the sort of thing that I done before. I didn't have sweet potatoes, this whole prep actually this time. In the past I've had sweet potatoes and I've just found that, you know what, they just mess up my guts and I've just, mm -hmm. I've had enough of just farting about all day. <laughs> like, no <laughs> pun intended. So I, I didn't do sweet potatoes on my um, contest prep and because the volume of carbohydrates I had was so high, I just thought, right, I'm going to get all this from um, glucose powder initially. So I slammed a whole load of glucose in. I think I did like about 120 grams of carbohydrates from glucose for the first three meals. Now, that didn't work too well, is what I discovered. Because of um, the process of osmosis, it fit, and carbohydrates attract water, it effectively pulled a lot of water mm. out of my um, GI tract, and then it just more or less passed through me. So I was like, okay... So the idea of having less carbohydrates from whole foods to try and get more carbohydrates into me by having it in powdered form wasn't really all that effective because it backfired a little bit there. But in my next contest prep that I did for UKDFDA, which I did prep for, I thought, well, okay, Jasker Jurgendrop, who's the guy who came up with the multi-carbohydrate transporter theory. So the premise is that you've got carbohydrate transporters within your um, within your GI tract. So you've got sodium and glucose transporter, and then you've got the, uh, it's not gluc 4, gluc 2, which uptake glucose within your, um, your GI tract. So the amount of carbohydrate you can absorb over your GI wall is limited by these transporters. Mm -hmm. But Jasker Jurgendrop's theory was, well, you've got fructose transporters as well, and if you combine glucose and fructose, and then take them at the same time, then you can get more carbohydrate across the membrane wall. And that allows you to absorb much more carbohydrate per hour, which is really important when you're doing endurance cycling. Yeah. So I thought, oh, well, okay, this is shot. Worked perfectly. So I got glucose, fructose, powder, combined the two, took 120 grams, no problem at all. So that was that was a little thing that I thought, ah, I've done science there. That was pretty good. <laughs> You've, you've, been, you've been quite clever there. So, yeah, that, that was something I did differently. Um, I didn't go as high as on the water because I've been playing about that for a while. And, I mean, you've got water in, in food. So some of that water, I just thought, well, maybe I don't need to drink nine litres of water anymore when I'm getting ready because I don't want to – because I think that's what really bums out a lot of people when they do classical carbohydrate loading for um, for bodybuilding. The drinking so much water just seems to, to end them and you get – headaches and probably suffer mildly from a hyponatremia or right. something like that alongside it. So I changed that. So I peaked that using the gluten and the fructose powder. I thought that worked really, really well. Um, 
that just made the whole process manageable, particularly when you're consuming like a thousand two hundred grams of carbide. Well, what was I saying? Yeah, so I did the universe show after that. Yeah, um, I talked about that already. I recommend that be. And then for the world, same. Um, what did I do for that? Uh, I think I more or less copied exactly that UK DFDA heating protocol that I did as well for uh, for that one. Um, I've often thought, should I change the peaking approach? Because for endurance training, classical carbohydrate load has kind of changed. You no longer do this sort of deplete phase because it's maybe not necessary to do the super compensation. And there, I mean, you could do a full show just talking about peaking and what the, yeah. the way to do um, the peaking process is. I mean, consecutive peaking is really hard. I was fortunate that those sort of peaks that I did, they were about a month apart at least, yeah. the big ones that I did. So that maybe gave me enough time to recover. I wouldn't recommend doing them on consecutive weeks. That's because the, the amount of salt and water that inevitably goes in there after it and the adaptation that's has to your body, you just hold water. You don't know where you're at. It's very stressful. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of things there. Does that answer the question? No, definitely. So they were kind of like yes. a deplete, like a, not a, I'd say probably like a backload approach um, where you kind of fronted that backload with a higher amount of carbs and then tapered yeah, it down right. as yep. visuals kind of confirmed what was going on. Is there any way yeah. you, the, the kind of carbohydrates you initially chose, did you base that off any, some people base it off refeed data or some do a certain multiplier ah, by yes. body weight? So, I mean, if you look in the literature on this one, um, recommendations are up to around about 12 grams per kilogram of body weight as a carbohydrate load for the, the first day. Um, I base it off of my average carbohydrate intake and then do a multiple of three. And that seems to give you a number which is very similar to okay. around about that 12 grams as well. So it's, it's there or thereabouts. And then over the years, I've adjusted that number to see if you can take it a little bit higher or a little bit, a little bit lower. Um, I guess what you want to do from a pragmatic approach is you want to put the most carbs in initially to see how it affects your appearance but then it's difficult because you're drinking so much water as well inevitably you end up looking a little bit blurry and not as good as you could look and you need to look your best at the two or three days away from the show rather with sorry rather two or three days after you do that initial load rather than on that particular day of it i mean there, there's a lot of variables to uh, to manipulate how i've often described it as after you do that first day, you're often, you're a little bit fuller after you've just been flat as anything for the first day, but you're always watery. And then you wake up the next day and you're somehow, despite all the carbohydrates you've had, you're still a little bit flat. So you need to put the water in again, get the carbohydrates in you. And then by about the, the end of that day too, you're starting to look all right again. Mm -hmm. And then you put a little bit more carbohydrates in on the third day and you roughly by the end of the third day, you're more or less bang on the money how, how you're going to look for the particular show. I guess what you'd want to do is you'd want to adjust those carbohydrate intakes either on one of those three days. And I would probably think I'd want to do it furthest away because that's less likely to have a negative impact yeah. on you closer to the show. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, like the it's become kind of trademarked by Cliff Wilson, the rapid backload approach where maybe you do it in the, the last 24 hours there's just a, a lot of risks involved with that approach yeah. and it yeah. may pay off for some people but like you said if you're new to it or you're a bit kind of risk averse you can still look fantastic and have a bit of a a safer way of doing it like you said you have some time to adjust if things aren't quite right yeah. i mean the, there was a we published a paper on this and i see there was one that came out recently that's where they actually tested this and showed that carbohydrate loading increases the the silhouette so it yeah. actually does make you does make it does work <sighs> can you get it down to an exact science oh it's i mean there's a lot of variables you're manipulating yeah. so i think it's just best that as you said that you're pragmatic with it um, and you, you you find a method at least that you're comfortable with and then you adjust it thereafter that because there's no doubt that manipulating your food can change the way that you appear on stage and sometimes it's for some people it'll not be worth the stress other people, it's just a ritual that they go through yeah. and they, they want to do it. I mean, there's a lot we can we can talk about on that particular front. Oh, no, we've 100%. Talked about, we've talked about so much here <laughs> in this particular session. It's an hour's gone just like that.
So um, we've done peaking here. In terms of common mistakes, I mean, do, do we want to get on this? Well, I think you covered a lot of the kind of some of the at least mistakes you made. Um, I don't yeah. know if there, there's something I was feeling that we could end on, which I think would be sure. quite powerful uh, as an ending. And I think it's something probably in your mind because you just yeah. did an Instagram post about the uh, prepare to suffer mentality. And I just thought it was something that's very refreshing to hear from a coach, a pro, a natural bodybuilder who does go through it. And yeah. I'd love for you to share that kind of to the audience and what kind of you feel is the right kind of attitude to have going into a prep and maybe what the wrong one is. All right. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, I mean, maybe go and, go and check out the Instagram and you'll maybe come across it. I know this will come out in a, probably a few weeks time. You'll maybe have to do some, uh, some, some creeping again on it. <laughs> um, I guess anyone that's watching this podcast or, and has seen me on this just now will see that I'm quite animated. Hopefully I'm quite easy going. If, Thing. Hopefully I'm quite upbeat and likable. And I guess the message was that, look, I guess I'm, I'm sick and tired of seeing people coming into bodybuilding or coaches say things like, to get 100% in shape and, and ready for the contest, then you absolutely have to suffer. This is it. You, you've got to be in the trenches and absolutely miserable and and hating on your your life to to get yourself in shape for for a for a contest, and it just when when I think when I see these posts, I'm like, oh come on, get over, like, so just get over yourself. What are you talking about? It, you can choose to make this hard or not. This is completely up to yourself in this sort of perspective. And actually, telling people that they're going to suffer is not. A useful way to help them get ready for for contests. I mean, it's very simple, like basic psychology. If I'm trying to build you a car, I'll just tell you, get this car. It's great. Trust me. All my mates have like this car as well. And if I want to dissuade you from buying something, I'll just tell you it's rubbish. In the same way, if I tell you that you're going to suffer, you will start thinking, oh, "God, this is going to be terrible. It's going to. I'm going to suffer from this." And uh, but if I tell you, look. There might be times that this will be a little bit challenging, but it's a really great and exciting process, and you're going to see your body change throughout. And it's really any point in this, and that, and that we just we try our best throughout because it's this is a really fun thing that we're doing here. Then you're going to find it a much more positive experience. That, that's the point I think. I guess I was trying to make. I mean, the other thing is from a coaching perspective, and you'll be so aware of this as well, Steve. It's it's sometimes difficult to predict how people are going to respond to things. And you've probably got people you're working with just now that are prepping for shows or getting ready to prep for shows. And you're thinking that person's going to find it more hard than that other right. person, or it's going to be more challenging. And they've got some more life circumstances going on and that might make it a bit more of an effort. So I'm going to have to invest more time helping that person. And then you've got another person who's much more easy going. And if you are to predict it right off, you think that person's going to be a bit more of a challenge. That person's not, I'm going to have to help them out. But you don't know how it's going to go. Yeah. I mean, that person who's got all the things going on might be far more resilient. They might have a personality type that they just get on with it, no grumbles, and your calls and check-ins that you have for this person are, yep, Steve, no problem at all, I'm on it, it's great. Whereas the other person that's like, oh, I can't handle this, Steve. It's really, really hard. I don't know what to do. Just, so I guess try and treat everyone as an individual, try and be positive and, and stop filling people's minds with, with absolute nonsense and have some perspective. we do this for fun. Yeah. <laughs> do it for fun. It should be fun. And it is fun. It's great get up and, getting up on stage. And I know you're going to be in a great place. You see, Steve, seeing your body change and seeing people say, oh, you've looked better than last time. It's all great. It's all good. And sure, it's hard sometimes, but like... No one's asking you to go into a war zone or anything like that. <laughs> Some people do say that, go into war, right? Um, that, I've heard that turn of phrase. <laughs> it's so cliche. Like, I went to the movies at the end and I seen 1917. That's really cool. And, like, you're watching that and you're like, your jaw's just on the floor, like, watching that because you're putting yourself in the position of those guys. And people are saying, in the trenches, get over. <laughs> yeah, I think your pers I, I find your perspective very refreshing there because I think there's there's a fine line between like a coach being 
like you have to tell your client how it is and give them expectations but you don't want to fill them with dread and kind of thoughts become things right so if you end up thinking oh this prep is going to be hell i'm going to be feeling like this and this because my coach has told me to expect to be dreadful if anything we should be doing the opposite and say how kind of positive things are going to be and how we can make it as least stressful as possible so and then obviously everyone's individual some people it will be more of a breeze than others so yeah i thought that was a very refreshing perspective and i thought a good one to share like I, I've often thought, like, I mean, the resilience is a, a skill you learn through, through bodybuilding diet. That when after I did my first bodybuilding show, like, I was like, do you know what? After I've done that, I can do anything. Like, I thought to myself, I was like, I'll get my degree that I was studying at the time because that was not as hard as getting up every single morning, doing the cardio, restricting my calories for long periods of time, being tired and exhausted. Like, after that, I was like, studying, piece of cake. Like, I can apply myself now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool. Andrew, I could probably talk to you for ages and we may have oh, to absolutely. get, get another good. get another podcast scheduled in in future. Yeah. I, I want to make sure we've mentioned your Instagram a few times and yeah. I know pro prep coaching is now fully fledged and fully running. Where, if people want to get coached by you or get more insights from you, where should they head? So Pro Prep Coaching, so www.propepcoaching.com. Check that out. We've also got an Instagram and a Facebook page by the same name, so Pro Prep Coaching. We've also got a ton of content now on YouTube from all the videos we did um, talking about bodybuilding and lifestyle and things like that. So that's Pro Prep Coaching by Steph Noble and Dr. Andrew Chappelle. And then finally, our Instagram handles, if you want to check us out on uh, that and see me lift things up and put them down again and then put the occasional post out that um, (laughs) resonates. Then that's fueled by Scott Soats because I'm very fond of eating Scott Soats. And then check out um, Steph Noble Figure Pro as well. She's a, Steph's a fantastic bodybuilder, really, really good. I'm always inspired when I, when I train with Steph and see her posts that she puts out and great, great bodybuilder. Fantastic. Thank you so much again, Andrew. And thank you all for listening. We'll catch you soon. Take care. All right. Cheers. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.